Okay, so started recording. This might be live on YouTube. Okay, all right. Thank you, everyone. We're very excited today to have Laura Pilosoff uh, presenting, and we're going to learn about the marginal propensity to consume. I put in the chat kind of the ground rules for the presentation. So basically, Laura is going to present for 45 minutes. As we go along, if any of you have questions about the paper, go ahead and put it in the Q&A. So not in the chat, put it in the Q&A. And then Laura's co-authors will go in and answer. And if there's something that we need to interrupt her, like it's a really big clarifying, we will do that. And then at the last 15 minutes, you will all have a chance to uh, ask questions directly of Laura. And then there's a little bit of a time after so right after one o'clock where you all can join if you wanna have like a smaller conversation with the co-authors and we'll get that Zoom link in the chat here. Okay, all right, so take it away, Laura. Okay, great. So happy to be here on the other side uh, of VMAX. So I'll be presenting joint work with Daniel Lewis and David M. Elkanji. They're both here to answer questions as I go along in the chat. Okay, so a crucial object in, in macroeconomics is the marginal propensity to consume or the MPC out of transitory income shock. So, you know, that number is obviously crucial for understanding the efficacy of any kind of fiscal or monetary policy. Um, but more recently, I think it's been recognized that there might be heterogeneity in the MPC. So it's not just one MPC, but people out there might have different MPCs. Um, and so the extent of MPC heterogeneity and what drives it are going to be also crucial uh, objects for understanding fiscal and monetary policy. Well, what we're going to argue is that actually, despite the importance of this object, like the heterogeneity in MPCs and what drives them, um, we don't really know. Um, I would say there's no conclusive answer on what is what drives MPC heterogeneity and whether there is any heterogeneity in general. And it's not because we don't care about those objects. Obviously, they're important. Um, it's because they're difficult to measure. And yeah. I'll get back to why exactly that is the case in a, in a moment. But for now, let me first describe just what um, has been done in the literature thus far in order to kind of get at this heterogeneity. So the first uh, of two approaches that have been done is to kind of go fully structural. So you write down a model. Um, whatever your favorite model is, it might be like a, um, a Hank model, and then that model is going to deliver an MPC distribution. And of course, the model presupposes what drives MPC heterogeneity. So in that context, it's going to be um, heterogeneity in wealth, which is going to determine the marginal propensity to consume out of an income shock. Then there's um, another li literature, which I would say is most more empirical, it's maybe semi-structural or reduced form, where they identify um, they have a well-identified transitory income shock. So for example, like the tax rebates, which is what we're gonna look at in this paper or um, lottery winnings, for example, in Norway and so on and so forth. And once they have that well-identified transitory income shock, they cut the data by some presupposed, presupposed observable drivers, for example, cut by above and below median wealth, re-estimate the MPC out of those transitory income shocks. And then you, you can talk about, you know, whether one group has a different MPC than another. So what we're gonna do instead is different from these two approaches. We're gonna propose a new way to estimate the distribution of MPCs directly. And we're gonna argue one that it doesn't require taking a stance on the drivers ex ante. So it's gonna be agnostic in that sense. And two, it's gonna recover the full degree of heterogeneity. So what I mean by that is because exactly we don't have to take a stance on what drives this MPC heterogeneity ex ante, it's going to uncover both observable and unobservable heterogeneity that delivers MPCs. And I'll be more explicit about that as I, as I go forward. Okay, so let me, let me return to why it's difficult in general to estimate the distribution of MPCs, and then I'll tell you how we kind of um, tackle this problem in this paper. So suppose you have some data on, let's say, uh, household consumption change. I'll call that YI here. You have a well-identified transitory income shock. Um, for example, the receipt of a tax rebate or a lottery winning, and then you have some observables, and then maybe you think you have some measurement error in your data. What you would ideally want to do is say, okay, let's say household I, um, if I could observe their, you know, their MPC directly, if that was just another variable in the data set, I'd be fine, and then I could just correlate that with whatever observables to see what drives MPC heterogeneity. Of course, we can't do that. If you have measurement error um, in your data, 
then you can't invert this. So you can't even, even if you don't have the MPC directly, if there's measurement error here, you're not gonna be able to back out from a household's information on the income shock and their consumption change, what their MPC is, right? And this is already, be, besides the fact that we don't, don't, or don't already know what the estimate for beta is. So that's the first thing. Um, but then you might say, well, let's say you have panel data, right? You can use panel data and then get around that problem. But what's what the issue with panel data is that one, you need multiple shocks at the individual level. So for example, you need to observe at, at the household level, a specific household receiving multiple like tax rebates, which is in general is not the case. You observe it once in the data. Even the lottery winnings, there's very few people that, that, that receive it twice. Um, and moreover, even if you could observe multiple shocks, they would have to, you'd have to assume that they're time invariant. So you'd have to say this, this household, um, I, I can see a bunch of uh, transitory income shocks they receive. If I assume they're time invariant, then I can identify the individual MPC that way. But of course, most of our theories say that there might be some state dependence in an MPC, right? It might depend on your current level of assets, your current income, and so on. And so we explicitly don't want to make that assumption. So what is our resolution going to be? We're going to, uh, you know, it's going to be similar to basically grouping on observables where you get identification through assuming like, you know, if I group based on, let's say, assets above and below median assets, right? And then I assume that within that group, the MPC is homogeneous, then I can identify the average uh, response to the tax rebate, for example, within that group. So what we're going to do is instead of grouping on an observable like assets, like I just mentioned, we're going to, we're going to group on an unobservable characteristic. So we're going to, we're going to, Create, we're going to both estimate, we're going to estimate jointly group membership, which I'm going to call G of I, and at the same time, the MPC within the group G of I, and within each group, the MPCs are homogeneous, okay? So how are we going to do that? That sounds like, you know, impossible, um, but actually clustering algorithms are exactly designed to do that. So what do clustering algorithms do in general? You know, you might be familiar with the means case, like just clustering based on a mean. Essentially, what it's doing is estimating jointly a group that an observation belongs to, as well as the group mean within the group. Um, so what we're going to do is something similar, except we're going to do it within a case where we're, we're clustering based on a regression coefficient, which in our case is the MPC rather than just a group mean. So uh, to that end, we're just going to we're going to develop a new regression-based estimator based off of these clustering algorithms. It's specifically going to be based off of the fuzzy C-means algorithm, and I'll describe in detail what what exactly that is. Up to now, it's only been used to cluster by a mean, as I mentioned, and we're gonna we're gonna do it based on a regression coefficient as well. Again, it fits exactly our goal. We're trying to say, you know, characterize households as having similar responses to a tax rebate. It's gonna allow us to recover this full heterogeneity again because we don't have to condition on observables first to recover it. We're gonna recover it first. We're gonna describe the heterogeneity and responses first, and then ex post, once we have a household estimate for the MPC, we're gonna be able to um, project those estimated MPCs on all the observable characteristics we have. Um, and I want to emphasize that one, one benefit of, being, of doing it this way, rather than the, the approaches I described earlier, is that um, you, can, you, you, don't, you, don't, you don't have to like, lose any statistical power that you would normally lose when you just cut the data by a bunch of observables jointly and then estimate the MPC within groups. We can just take the estimated MPC and project it and um, uh, we, we won't lose statistical power in that sense. And then on top of that, we can study joint significance. So previously you would just, you know, you would just look at above, below median income or, or, or some split of the data like that. Whereas because we've estimated an individual MPC, we can study joint significance. So we can look at what remains significant after controlling for many things jointly. Um, okay, so what I'll, what I'll do today is um, I'll, I'll describe the algorithm, not in crazy detail, but just enough to, I think, um, demonstrate exactly how it works. And then I'll go straight into the empirics and try to make sure I emphasize what our, what our results are on the empirics. But essentially, if the bottom line is that once we do this, sorry, once we do this algorithm, um, there are two characteristics, observable characteristics that remain uh, significant, uh, significantly correlated with the MPCs that we estimate. That would be non-salary income. So it's positively correlated with the MPC. And I'll return to that later and the average propensity to consume, which is um, one minus the savings rate. Okay, and um, hopefully I'll, I'll be able to discuss more of that at the end. Um, just briefly, how do we relate to the literature? Obviously, we relate to these clustering algorithms. Um, uh, 
Uh, just want to mention that there are other ways that you can get at MPC heterogeneity. One would be by looking at reported preferences. Claudia has some, a lot of work in that in that area. Perhaps the closest paper to ours is um, this paper that uses quantile regressions to uncover um, heterogene un uh, unobserved heterogeneity in the MPC. Um, if you're interested, we can have a detailed discussion on, on the differences between um, our methodology and that one at the end. So let me just start. Uh, what I'll do is I'll go first describe what the k-means uh, algorithm does for the group means case. Then I'll, I'll show you what fuzzy c-means is relative to that hard k-means case. And then after you understand that, the, the extension to the regression case is fairly straightforward. So what does the k-means algorithm do? It's minimizing this, this objective function here. You have some data y. You are assuming that the data has a group structure. So there might be capital G groups. Assume for now that capital G is fixed and that it's a parameter. And um, we talk in detail in the paper about how you pick that G, but for now, think of it as a parameter. So suppose you have some data Y, you wanna cluster your group, your data into G, capital G groups. The objective you're trying to minimize is the sum of squared residuals where you're putting each observation into a particular group, right? So not only are you estimating which group does observation Y belong to, but you're also estimating the group specific mean phi g. So it's a joint estimation. So notice that you could rewrite this in a slightly more general way. We could just you know, put it in as a weighted sum across groups. So we're gonna have the residuals for observation y if they're in group little g um, with, with some weight wg. In the hard k-means case, this, this weight that we have here is a binary weight in the sense that you are going to be assigned to the group that minimizes your, your residuals and it's going to be a hard assignment. So if, if group one lower minimizes your residuals, you're going to be there. Otherwise, every other group you have a weight of zero. And that's exactly what hard that's hard k means in a nutshell. So what does fuzzy c means do? It generalizes this hard k means just by adjusting the weight. So Instead of having this, this weight wg, we're going to replace it with some weight mu raised to the m. I'll get back to why, why we do this functional form in particular. But if you, if you take this as the, the, the objective function, where this is the weight, then when you take the derivative of this objective function with respect to the weight mu g, you can derive these optimal weights. This m is just a tuning parameter. So it's chosen by the researcher. That's something else we, we talk about in detail in the paper. But um, in general, it has to be greater than one. So why, why this objective function? Basically, um, if you don't have this parameter raised to the M and you wanna minimize this objective function, the optimal weights are gonna be binary. So there are many reasons why you don't wanna have binary, binary weights when you have cross-sectional data, one of which in particular is the presence of noise and assigning uh, observations to groups is very difficult in that case. And so this M, you know, this functional form makes it so that when you minimize this objective, you're not um, going to end up with optimal weights that are binary. You're going to end up with optimal weights that are uh, like this. The neat thing about this is in the limit, as you take this parameter m to 1, you're going to end up back in the, in the case I described earlier of hard, hard clustering. So this m really is just a tuning parameter that basically we think of as um, as uh, capturing the degree of noise that, that's, in your, that's in your data. OK, normally in um, how these things are implemented in practice is as follows. So they would be done, they would be done iteratively. So for example, let's say you were doing this fuzzy c-means thing. What you would do is first um, guess the weights for each household. Then you would calculate the weights using, um, sorry, calculate the parameter est estimates given the weights that you chose for each household. You would then estimate the parameters for each group given the weights and group membership, and then you would keep updating until, until you converge. So this makes it actually very hard to characterize any asymptotic properties of the estimator. Um, and it's also computationally, when you have a data set that's very large, in ours, it's going to be about 17,000. It's, it's very, very slow. So Yang and Yu, uh, these computer scientists, shows that you can rewrite the fuzzy c-means objective function without the weights. In particular, if you take the weights that I showed you, the optimal weights from earlier, you'll notice that the weights themselves are only a function of the data, so the outcome variable, as well as the parameters that you're trying to estimate, and then this tuning parameter n. So what you can do is if you just substitute them back in, then you end up with an objective function here, which 
has no weights whatsoever is just a function of this tuning parameter and the parameters you're trying to estimate. So it's a nonlinear objective function that's only a function of theta g. So why is this nice? Well, um, although th these authors never use it this way, you can see that the original objective function can be cast sort of as just minimizing a nonlinear objective with respect to the parameters of interest. Um, so that's basically what fuzzy C means is. So now I'm just going to show you how we extend this to think about clustering based on regression coefficients, because up to now, everything that has been done has been clustering based on a word mean. So what we're going to study is instead like a, a weighted least squares regression rather than the group means only. So we're thinking of you have some outcomes Y. In our case, that's going to be consumption changes. And then you have some controls. Think of this X as just containing like the, the, the receipt of the rebate. And we're trying to estimate the response to the receipt of the rebate on consumption, which is the MPC. And we're thinking that there's a group structure to that and that each group has a different MPC, but we don't know which households belong to which group. Okay, so we want to group based on the response to the rebate. So we're just going to alter the objective function from the group means case a little bit. And it's pretty straightforward. Instead of having just the group means, we have the regression um, the regression residuals. And we still have the same weights, except the weights are a function are a function of y condition, you know, that the consumption change conditional on x. Again, you just take the derivative of this objective function with respect to the weights, and you get these optimal weights, which are again not a function of um, you know, the weights themselves, obviously. They're only a function of the parameters of interest theta g. So what we show in the paper is that um, you know, if in the same way that Yang and Yu showed for the means case, you can show that once you do the substitution of these weights into the objective function, that the objective function written without the weights is equivalent to the one, um, the, the formulation with the weights. But what's nice about that is that now we can focus on this objective that doesn't have the weights in it at all, and it's just a single stage objective function, which is a function of the parameters of interest. Okay. Um, so, one thing we noticed is that actually, you know, if we're just we're in 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 econ, we're all pretty used to this problem, right? Now, what we want to do is take this objective function here and minimize it with respect to the parameters of interest theta g. So, if you do that, um, then you notice that this is really nothing but a or it could be cast as a GMM problem, where you have these moment conditions, where the moment conditions are that the derivative of the objective function with respect to the parameters of interest has to be zero. So that's exactly what we do. We, we apply standard kind of GMM results to this, this fuzzy, we call it fuzzy clustering parameters problem. And the solution, which means, you know, the parameter estimates are just going to be the standard solution to a GMM problem. Again, where these moment conditions are the, that the derivative of the objective is zero with respect to the parameters. Um, I won't go through this now, but of course you can see once you, once you notice that this clustering problem can be cast as a GMM problem, you get you can you can basically show consistency asymptotic normality. Um, we in the paper in the appendix we we develop all these um, we develop kind of the the formulation for different cases where you have common coefficients across groups where some of them where uh, where they're all the same and more generally when you have large t. We also extend all of our results to the case to an IV. We do that exactly because um, if you're familiar with the literature on the tax rebates, of course, there's um, a concern that the value of the rebate that the household receives is not, um, is not exogenous, might depend on you know, their income and so forth. And so what's typically done is that they instrument the value of the rebate with the receipt of the rebate. And so we, we extended our fuzzy C parameters to IV so we can explicitly accommodate that kind of, um, that kind of issue. I just want to point out here that the reason you can cast this as a GMM problem is exactly because we kind of smooth the objective function with this M parameter. So if you were in the hard k-means case, more or less, you, you wouldn't be able to, you know, just minimize that objective directly. You would have to do the iterative procedure. So that's kind of um, computationally what also makes this nice, in addition to accommodating some noise that you would have in cross-sectional data. Um, it also has some computational advantages. Okay. Um, I'm not going to go through this in the interest of time, but G and M, capital G, the number of groups, and M, the, the uh, tuning parameter, are important parameters uh, of this algorithm. 
So essentially, so in terms of choosing G, what we try to do is say, you know, suppose that the data that you that you have does not have a group structure. Um, so assume that for in our case, assume there is no MPC heterogeneity. And then run run our algorithm on that data. And you, what you're going to get is as you increase the number of groups, you're going to you know increase the fit of the data or minimize the sum of squared residuals just because you're increasing the number of groups and you're fitting noise. And so what we try to do is kind of normalize any gains that we get in in our algorithm from increasing G to that case. So we want to say, look, if we if we inc lower the RSS and increase the fit. Um, it has to be more than the increase that you would get in data that actually has no group structure, which gives us a sense of how much more you're, you're fitting noise uh, for it to be like a statistically meaningful, um, statistically meaningfully picking up any MPC heterogeneity. Um, for M, we, we also take a data dri driven rule and we can, we can discuss more on that um, at the end if you're interested. This is uh, one thing I wanna mention before I get to the empirical results. So there's an issue related to, you know, the true data generating process that we're, we're thinking of is one that's hard. So we're assuming, you know, in the back of our minds, the way we're thinking about the DGP is that each household has an MPC and it has a group structure, right? Our objective function that we're minimizing is assuming this fuzziness, meaning that you don't, you don't belong to a specific group in a hard sense. So there, there's, um, there's sort of like a, clash, let's say, between the, the true DGP and the objective. So, and everything that we show is consistency rel relative to the minimizer of that objective function. So what we're uncovering in terms of consistency, asymptotic normality, and so on, is that it is relative to this pseudo true parameter, meaning the, the parameter, the minimizer of that objective. So the natural question is, how close is that pseudo true parameter from the truth, from like the true underlying group, uh, group parameter estimates, group specific MPC? MPCs. Um, one thing we do is that um, we show in a very simple case where you have like just two cluster means, um, we show and, and you have a single cross section of data, we show that our, um, our FCP estimator is, is able to accurately, you know, and consistently uncover the true group memberships for some choice of the parameter n. The other thing we do is show via extensive simulations in the paper that what we do works extremely well and we compare it to many other competing alternatives. One of them being the hard, hard group clustering, the others being quantile regressions and likelihood based kind of competitors like um, um, Gaussian mixture models, for example. Okay, this is just a snapshot from these simulations, but essentially the truth, you know, in our, we do some simulations where you have some true number of groups, let's say five, and this is the CDF of MPCs. And what we do is then show our results, which is the red dots versus all the other kind of competitors. And consistently across different uh, examples where you have different number of groups, different degrees of noise, our algorithm um, gets very, very close to the truth relative to all the other alternatives. Okay. So in the remaining time, I want to, um, let me first take stock. So what we've shown is that you can extend this fuzzy C-means algorithm from the cluster means case to regression problems as well as IV problems. And once you do that, analytical inference gets fairly easy um, because you can apply all these, um, whatever we know from GMM. In practice, the GMM formulation of the problem also, we believe, delivers this computational advantage and because you can directly minimize the objective function instead of doing this iterative procedure. We think this approach is well suited for any clustering problem, um, in particular for short panels and cross-sectional data, which is going to be the case um, in our setting. And so it could be used in any kind of setting where you think that there's some unobserved heterogeneous response um, and you want to estimate the, un the unobserved heterogeneous groups. Um, again, we show in the paper that it works well in simulations. Okay, so with that in mind, let me move now to, to the empirical setting. This was our original question that got us thinking about how to, how to uncover this heterogeneity. So what we're interested in is understanding how much heterogeneity is there in MPCs and what drives them. So we're, the data we're going to use is going to be kind of an off-the-shelf experiment. We're going to use the 2008 tax rebates that were previously studied extensively in um, a series of paper by Parker Johnson Sulelas. Um, in there, in that um, 
to, in the 2008 econo economic stimulus payments, households got rebates from the government that were approximately, you know, more or less $1,000, and the timing was random. So the, the rebates, whether you got them in one, you know, in September, October, and so on, that was determined by the last two digits of your social security number. And so, you, you know, there's random assignment in terms of when the rebate was received. And so what the authors have did in this paper is to use that exogenous variation in the timing of the rebate receipt to estimate an MPC by comparing uh, the consumption changes for those who received the rebate within a given month to those who didn't. Um, and so that's going to be like the rebate coefficient or the MPC. The data comes from the consumer expenditure survey, and there's going to be quarterly interviews. So I just want to emphasize the data does have a panel aspect. We're only, you know, as was done in the, the original papers, we're only going to use the panel dimension of the data to construct, uh, to construct consumption changes. But we're not going to, you know, as I mentioned in the beginning, we're not going to make any assumption that a, group, uh, a household MPC is time invariant or anything like that. We're just going to, once we construct consumption changes, we're going to go back to thinking that the data is um, a single cross section. The rebate data was also added to the survey, and so we can observe how much how much the household got and what what month they received it. So here's here was the original specification. You have a, a regression of consumption changes at house for household J on some observable characteristics, the rebate RJ, and then this phi was the you know the parameter of interest, the MPC. The demographics that were included in the in the in the original paper were, were pretty sparse because you know we had we have this randomization so you don't really need to control extensively for things but things like age and changes in the number of uh, individuals in the household were put in there, including uh, as well as month month dummies to pick up any time series effects. So what, the way we're thinking of the problem is instead to say okay each household J might belong to a specific group G, and each group G is characterized by an MPC by G. And then we're also going to allow for each, each group to have um, an, a, a fixed effect governing its group membership as well. So each, each group is going to be described by a, a average consumption change as well as the uh, response to the rebate. Why do we put in this extra fixed effect? It's basically because you know there might be some other things that are going on in the data in particular um, there might be some income shocks that are coming in at the same time as the rebate is coming in. The income shocks we don't actually observe very well in the CEX. And so, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to bias our estimates of these MPCs by conflating income shocks with the receipt of the rebate in case, you know, some household loses their job and so they have less money and then they spend a higher amount of the rebate, for example. So just to show you how this kind of problem that we're talking about fits into the, the FCP fuzzy C parameters formulation I mentioned earlier, you take that objective function, here are, sorry, here are our regression residuals. And now all we're trying to do is condition on some group capital G and some tuning parameter M. We're gonna minimize this objective function with respect to the group parameters alpha G, the fixed effect and the uh, group MPCs. So if you have, capital G groups, you're going to have two times capital G parameters to estimate. Um, and it's as simple as that, this nonlinear objective function you throw in like your favorite minimizer and, and that, then you're done. Okay, so now let me let me move to our, our empirical results. So what I'm showing you here is the distribution of MPCs that we estimate for total expenditures. So I'll show you in a minute what it looks like for durables and non-durables separately, but let me just mention a few, a few things about this distribution. What I'm plotting here is the weighted MPC. So for each household, our algorithm is going to um, estimate a household-specific weight, which roughly represents the probability of belonging to groups one through five. I should mention our, um, our choice of the number of G led us to pick five groups. So we're gonna have five estimated MPCs and each household is gonna have an estimated weight. And what we're plotting here is the weighted average at the household level. So this is the histogram of that object. You can also plot a histogram of the modal weight, we call it. So the, the weight that's, a, the, the group that's associated with the maximal weight. And of course, then you're just gonna have five points and a, dis, a, a distribution over those five points. What you can see from this figure is one that, you know, most of, 
the majority of households spend a, a non-trivial amount of the rebate, so somewhere between 0.25 and 0.4. And as the MPC increases, the share of households with a higher MPC decays. Um, I want to emphasize that what we get is that the lower bounds on this MPC is much higher than zero, significantly different from zero. So we can't, so we reject, we can't, we reject the idea from this, from this data that any household actually has a zero MPC out of total expenditures. Um, the second thing we should point out is that you can look at the, in the black line, what we're plotting here is the average MPC. So the weighted average across our heterogeneous MPCs relative to what you would get if you estimated in this red line, this is the homogeneous counterpart. So if you ran that homogeneous regression, what would the coefficient be? Um, of course, these are different. I mean, you shouldn't expect them to be different except for in very extreme cases. And in the paper, we kind of go through why you would expect to see differences between the weighted average and the homogeneous response. Again, we can get back to that um, in detail later if you're interested. One other thing we can do, I won't go through this in detail, is we can conduct inference using the, um, using the analytical formulas we have for the, for the asymptotic distribution of our estimators. Um, we can do it both in a way that takes into account the uncertainty around group membership. That's the analytical formulas we provide. Or you can uh, do it conditional on group membership, in which case you can use the formulas from a weight of, uh, for the asymptotic distribution from a weight of least squares problem. Um, we show that, you know, the bottom line from that is that when we're looking at inference on whether, when we're doing tests of whether these MPCs are different, they're all significantly different from each other and significantly different from zero. Um, that's kind of the bottom line from that exercise. Um, this, this just shows you the IV uh, version of our algorithm when we do it with total expenditures. And we just want, what we show here is that even if you do the IV where you instrument for the, the rebate value with just the receipt of the rebate, you get pretty much the same picture. The lower bound is maybe shifted up a little bit. Um, so you still get that, you know, the, the, the lower MPC is definitely not zero. And moreover, you start to get uh, a couple of MPCs that uh, definitely exceed one. So, but if anything, you know, it just makes the heterogeneity even more, more, more severe in that sense. Here is, um, first I'll show you non-durables now. So we can, the CEX data has detailed consumption expenditure data. So we can look both at non-durables and durables separately. So non-durables, not surprisingly, actually, you know, the distribution of MPC shifts to the left relative to total expenditures. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's definitely a bunch of households that have, that are consistent with the permanent income hypothesis here where they just, you know, consume a small amount of the rebate on non-durables. Um, but still, even so, there's a significant, I think about 8% actually have an MPC that's like above 0.4. Um, and then most people have a non-negatable, statistically different MPC from zero, but still fairly, fairly close to zero. For durables, as you might expect, um, although we were quite surprised to see that this came out, it's, it's actually centered around zero, the, the distribution of MPCs. So most households don't uh, use the rebate to purchase durables. But there is a non-negligible fraction of households that actually, you know, use use uh, more than 50% of the rebate to purchase durable goods, and so we view this as being kind of consistent with the lumpy adjustment of durables, where you know you might get the rebate and you were planning to buy uh, a car or something like that, and then getting the rebate puts you over the threshold, and so you you're able to use some of the rebate to finish that that purchase, whereas everybody else just doesn't use it to spend on durables. Okay, so um, just to summarize up to this point, I know I'm going through this quickly, but um, basically the main facts that come out of this analysis when we look at the unconditional distribution is that all households spend at least part of the rebate when you look at total, total goods, goods expenditures. And we, we think that the, the fact that we uncover this lower bound significantly above zero is interesting and also in line with maybe kind of a couple of papers that are recently thinking about why there is this MP, uh, high MPC at the bottom. There is variation across consumption good cat categories. So it looks like households do smooth non-durable consumption by and large. Um, and then we, what, what we're headed to next is looking at the, you know, the unobserved component of, of what drives this heterogeneity. So we've just been looking at the unconditional, unconditional distribution. And now what we want to do is ask what drives heterogeneity in this distribution? 
is going to be a, comprised of both observed and unobserved characteristics. And so what we're going to do in order to analyze these two contributors is first look at just individual correlations between whatever observables we have in our data and the MPCs that we estimate. Then we'll do this joint analysis where we look at um, different covariates jointly. And then we'll look at the R squared from those regressions because now we have the full unconditional distribution of MPCs. We can say what fraction of the variation in MPCs is explained by the observables that, that we can actually measure. Okay, so the first, the first thing we do is look at individual correlations. Um, so one thing to note uh, or that I wanna emphasize here is that we find a, actually a lot of things or observable characteristics individually correlate with MPCs that we estimate. And this is kind of in stark contrast to previous studies that, I, that have used even the same data set where typically you would find that almost no observable characteristic correlates with MPCs. Um, and we think that the reason that we're, we're able to uncover this is because we, we, as I mentioned earlier, we get around this issue of having to like do these sample splitting uh, and estimating MPCs within group. Now we can actually, we have an MPC at the individual level, which we can correlate. Um, but perhaps more, more importantly, what we can do is actually do a joint analysis. So what we're doing here is running a regression of the MPC for total expenditures. We do it you know, always with the weighted average MPC or the modal MPC in both cases. What we're gonna do is run a regression of those MPCs on whatever observables we have in the CEX. We do, it, we do two regressions, one which includes um, information on liquid assets, which have been kind of known to be not very good in the CEX. So, you know, that's why we don't, we don't take them too seriously, but we also do it without uh, liquid assets in the right-hand column. The main message that comes out of this analysis is um, doesn't change regardless of whether you include liquid assets or not, or if you look uh, across different MPCs that we estimate uh, for total expenditures. The first is that the only two observable characteristics that remain important for, or that are positively correlated with MPCs is log non-salary income and the average propensity to consume. So the average propensity to consume is something we construct again using the panel aspect of the CEX. And it's basically, we, we leave out the month in which they receive the, re, receive the rebate. So we don't get like a mechanical correlation here. And this is just a measure of like on average, what fraction of their income does this household consume? Um, and the log non-salary income is basically business and dividend uh, income from CEX. So the first positive correlation with log non-salary income might kind of be counterintuitive if you're thinking through the lens of like our standard um, incomplete markets type models. Um, nonetheless, what I would what I want to highlight is that one, it's not salary, it's not the salary portion of income, it's the non-salary portion of income. Two, we can't rule out, of course, that this is maybe consistent with um, the wealthy hand to mouth type of story, exactly because we can't control very well for liquid and illiquid assets. So, you know, to the extent that non-salary income is capturing, you know, these these really wealthy people who have lots of money tied up in like uh, whatever places that they can't get the money out from, um, it could that could be consistent with that story. The APC, however, um, is something that I think maybe has received a little bit or is starting to receive a little bit more attention. So I'm thinking of the, the recent paper by uh, Aguiar, Bill, Karina, um, uh, and Boris. So basically the idea is that, you know, if you look at the APC, it looks like those who are spending a lot of money in general tend to also have higher MPCs as well. Um, so our results empirically here are consistent with the idea that, you know, there might be some uh, unobservable heterogeneity and preferences that drives the average propensity to consume, which is also leading people to have high marginal propensities to consume. Um, what we do is look at then taking these two drivers, the log non-salary income and the average propensity to consume, and we just look at the joint distribution of these objects and the MPC in this figure. And the one thing that we want to highlight is that there seems to be these group, this one, you know, this particular group of rich spenders who have both a high average propensity to consume and also have a high log non-salary income that have high MPCs. And so, you know, as I mentioned earlier, while this this log non-salary income correlation with the MPC might be consistent with um, like a wealthy hand to mouth story, um, there's also this issue that those people also tend to have a high APC, which I think kind of maybe is another dimension that, that, that deserves a little bit more attention. 
So lastly, um, one, one thing we want to point out is that the R squared on this regression is fairly low. Now, I, I'm going to, I just want to say here, like we did lots of interactions. We've done like some lasso stuff. So this is not just because we put in linear, uh, linear observables here or whatever. It's very hard to get an R squared above like 15% in these kinds of regressions. And so the way we interpret that is to say we have the full distribution of MPCs. Most of the observables that we can control for are only explaining about at most 15% of the variation that we estimate. And so to us, that suggests that a lot of the heterogeneity in MPCs can be driven by latent characteristics, especially because, you know, on top of that, the APC might also be driven by unobservables. That, so it's already picking up some, some of that. One, one nice thing is that we do in the paper is we show via Monte Carlo simulations that um, this is not like a result of spurious heterogeneity that our algorithm is picking up. So we do exercises where we assume that there's no group structure in our data. And you know, we re-estimate and then redo the correlations with observables that we have. And the T statistic is well centered around zero. And so you wouldn't, you know, um, you wouldn't be picking up what this suggests is that in general, you, sh you shouldn't expect that the algorithm is going to pick up spurious heterogeneity when there, when there is no heterogeneity, the algorithm correctly says that the correlation with, you know, let's say the, this is the T stat for the APC, so that the correlation is basically zero. Um, in the last three minutes, I'll just describe the aggregation exercise that we do. Um, we take the the standard regression that we were running earlier, and we extend it to allow for a lagged effect of the rebate receipt, so two period uh, response to the rebate. And now we're not only are we estimating a heterogeneous unobserved response from the contemporaneous effect, but also a heterogeneous unobserved response from the lagged receipt of the rebate. And then what we do is once we've re-estimated this, we aggregate up. So we kind of compute the aggregated effect at the individual level and then take the average of that. And this is basically giving us a average of the two quarter MPC, which is what you see in black versus the homogeneous equivalent. And this is kind of where we get this headline number of twice as large as the as, as compared to the homogeneous estimates. So this suggests that, you know, even if you're not interested in, in understanding the heterogeneity per se, um, statistically, econometrically, you know, the you can get a very different answer in terms of like the aggregated response, if you take into account the fact that there's some heterogeneity in those responses underlying it. Um, so just so that I end the time, I'll conclude here. So we developed this new algorithm, this fuzzy C-means based clustering algorithm. We think it's useful more broadly for other questions that are trying to think of unobserved heterogeneous responses. We uh, generalize it from the cluster of means case, both to a regression setting and IV. We show the asymptotic properties. It's very simple to implement. We'll definitely be putting the code online. Um, we recover this full unconditional distribution of MPCs, which we think is useful for disciplining kind of macro models of MPC heterogeneity. We don't have to assume what the correlates are of this MPC distribution to do it. Uh, so it's a very agnostic in that sense. And then we show that the factors that do predict MPCs are log non-salary income and past spending. Sorry, Morgan, this should not be there. And uh, that there's a quantitatively large role for unobserved heterogeneity. Um, well, I... cool. All right. Well, thank you, Laura and the team. This is like this is a super cool paper, and it makes me feel much better about having pushed so hard to get direct payments out in this crisis. People spend it's very different this time, but like this, that's really interesting, and that you're pushing a has been a very interesting literature looking at the heterogeneity. So great. All right. So now, and thank you to all of you who've been participating. The question, the Q&A has had a lot of really good back and forth in it. So now we're going to move to the Q&A for the, you know, all of you can raise your hand, go to the participant function, and there's a little place where you as an attendee can raise your hand once and I really would encourage even if you put things in the Q&A I think a lot of those questions would be ones that it'd be good to hear Laura's take on it too and um, bring it in the open. In the meantime while you are lining up your questions Ralph had a question that he wanted to ask of Laura so go for it. Thanks Claudia. Thanks Laura. A great presentation. Uh, just a quick question about this unobserved heterogeneity. Mm -hmm. uh, 
So I guess the panel dimension is too short, but can you observe people a second time and estimate the MPC? So you see whether it's always the same people and have you also tried to control for more like permanent income and some, some other more yeah. permanent characteristics so we can learn whether it's about preferences or whether about you know some other permanent yeah. differences? So with this particular data set, we can't exactly because you know they, they only get the rebate once and then we only observe that once. We, so we would need multiple shocks to observe mm -hmm. it. What we can do though is, so basically if you're familiar with like the BPP type of approach um, in the PSAD, you can cast that problem as an IV problem, right? That's what like the passer coefficient is. So you actually could, once you view it like that, you could run this algorithm, assuming that there's unobserved heterogeneity in the passer estimate. And in that setting, because the PSAD is a panel, you can actually, you know, start to answer those kind of questions. So we've been, we've been talking about doing this. We haven't done it yet. But we can't do it in this data set. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So you all are being shy. I don't see any hand. Well, maybe I need to scroll up. Are there hands? Oh, there is a hand raise. Excellent. All right. So go ahead, Andy. You should be able to. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so, so what kind of assumptions would you need if you wanted to use the uncovered group heterogeneity to direct? sort of direct transfers, right? So can I say from your results that this group would have a much higher aggregate effect if I was to just send the checks to them? Right. So the, the assumption, so we, we actually don't have to make an assumption on how the, the estimated MPCs that we have vary at the, like the aggregate, with the aggregate state because we're only estimating it like in a single cross section at a single point in time. So the question is whether you can, whether these kind of correlations that we're uncovering would persist if like you, we did another rebate experiment. Um, so whether these coefficients are state dependent in terms of aggregate state. So I don't know, we'll have to see again, if, if you know, we'll have to see with other data, whether it's the case, but if, if it's true that the average propensity to consume seems to be a good, um, predictor of it that uh, of the MPCs and that's like a time in or a not state dependent relationship, then you can say, you know, next time we would expect this to happen. Um, so the, uh, you know, basically the assumption is if you want to use this going forward in terms of future rebates, you would have to assume that the correlations that we estimate with observables are not dependent on the aggregate state. And then, so like if the distribution, let's say of non-salary income moves, that's fine. But the relationship with MPCs once you let that distribution move wouldn't change. That's, that's what you would need to assume. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter if people are selecting into these groups that you're uncovering? Um, well, so the idea is that there's no, I mean, there shouldn't be any selection because we're, we're uncovering like, you know, we're putting people in groups based on their responses. So it's not that um, we're, there's like some selection on unobservables, right? That's exactly, we're uncovering the group that they're in based on an unobservable group membership, if that makes sense. So I don't think so, no. The only assumption that you would need is that the parameters that we estimate are not dependent on the aggregate state. And then, you know, the distribution can move, but I think, I think that's the only assumption you need. I don't know if David or Daniel has any other input on that. No, yeah, I think that you said everything. I mean, the the variation is exogenous. So as long as the assignment is random, there is no selection into the group. Uh, but I agree that like taking the results and its external validity has to be taken with a grain of salt because uh, MPC might be changing over time and in a different episode, uh, the distribution could change. Okay, all right. Thanks for your question, Andy. I do hope we'll get some other questions from the floor. We got about 10 more minutes. And uh, Davide, do you want, like, because there really was a lot in the Q&A, do you want to re-ask for someone something you thought was particularly important to bring out in the paper? I think that there was a lot of interest in the paper, so I feel like, you know, keep telling us about it. Sure, yeah. So there were a couple of questions about exactly what is no salary income. Uh, and uh, as I 
as I wrote in the Q and A, uh, this is literally anything that is not salary income. Uh, so it's a very uh, accurate definition in this sense. So this is both including transfers, uh, financial income, business income. We find that if we define entrepreneurs or financial investors as those that have a non-zero business or financial income, they are associated with a higher MPC unconditionally, but the intensive margin is important as well. So it doesn't seem to be that it's just a type that has a different MPC possibly because the cyclicality of their income or their variation uh, is different, uh, but the intensive margin is important, is important as well. Uh, and if someone has wants to follow up on this question, please, please do. Um, then there was... Uh, well, and I'll the, interrupt you. We'll keep that because now sure. we have two more hands up. See, this is good. Can we get you guys to talk? All right. So, Frank, I'm going to... You're allowed to talk now, so unmute yourself and go ahead and... Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Awesome. Uh, thanks for the presentation. That was great. Uh, just a quick question, but I think you perhaps answered. So if I were to simulate, you know, a kind of like a consumption saving model where agents would say have a liquid asset and a liquid asset, some boring constraints, and they would be the, the same in all other dimensions, then I would, you know, simulate say, a few thousands of, of, of histories for those guys. And then, you know, take the data, you know, perhaps, you know, do some, some, some rebate at some point and then take the data and put that in your algorithm. Did you do that? And you know, what, do you, what do you get if you do that? I mean, if you have done that, and if not, you know, what, what would be interesting to, to see? I mean, it's a bit, yeah, yeah. it's a bit, uh, you, know, intense, you know, kind of extensive work, but that would be kind of kind of thing, uh, cool to see. Yeah, yeah. So we haven't, we haven't actually done that, um, but we definitely could do it. So basically take, take data generated from, from a model and then see if the algorithm works on that. The only reason, so there's like a couple of like sub questions in there. The first is like in, in those models, you have like a continuous distribution. Um, and so every, all the simulations that we've done are, you know, assuming that the distribution is, uh, is, has a group structure. And in that sense, it works really well. So the question is if the underlying distribution is continuous, what exactly does this algorithm do? And we haven't, we actually haven't carried that out yet, but you absolutely could, could do that. Um, uh, can, can I can I uh, continue? Yeah, yeah. yeah no, just you know. So I was really thinking of not doing a generic review model, but just you know simulating many many individuals. Oh. And then you know you know, and then and then I'm guessing that you know things like the in which quintile of the wealth distribution you are is very likely to be your kind of group because it's very likely to have a direct direct impact on on your on your um, MPC. So you know even if it's like if it's not a perfect group, group structure. Uh, you know that's exactly why it would be interesting to 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 to, to, to do that because I, I guess that in the real world it's very likely that there's not a strict uh, group structure on that, but more kind of continuous distribution. Okay, so you're yeah, so you're asking about like basically what would happen what would happen in that world where it is more continuous and we apply our algorithm. Right, that and then you know you get NPCs and then you you correlate you know you correlate uh, you project on on wealth say and then you just yeah. see what happens. If... No, we can we can do that. We haven't we haven't yet. Um, thank can. you. Yeah, thank you. All right. Okay. So, Bren, Brenda, you should be unmuted now. So, go ahead with your question. Hi. Uh, thank you. Yes, I just have two questions. Um, it seems like both of the parameters, G and M, are very important uh, for some of the results. And you mentioned how for G, you uh, take into account this trade off between overfeeding. Um, Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, having lower values of G. But can you mention briefly how, what? How, did you do something similar for M? Do you face a similar trade-off when choosing M? And how do you address it? Yeah. Hi, Brenda. I'll let Davide go go for that one if he wants. But yes, we did. Yeah, um, and I and I let Daniel to add something if, uh, since he's the <laughs> in-house conversation. If he wants to add more, but uh, I also actually also have one thing to say. So <laughs> before you go, so. It's true that our algorithm in, like introduces this parameter M, um, which maybe you would think is, which we, we don't know. And now we have to take a data, de data dependent approach to fix it, um, which David will tell you what it is in a second. The, the other algorithms like hard k-means, for example, while there's no like tuning parameter in the actual objective itself, 
actually when you go to implement it, there's like three or four tuning parameters you have to pick in terms of like computational stuff. Um, so I just wanted I just wanted to like point out that um, you know it might seem that we're introducing some extra parameters, but in reality, like we're kind of also removing some as well. Um, that's just one thing I want to say. I just wanted to add, yeah, that the the way the way in which we pick uh, um, M is is a data driven rule. We are just trying to trade off the fit of the model with the entropy, so uh, the degree and the relative degree of misassignment. But again, this is really data driven. We don't have a we don't have a generic theory to to pin down an optimal M, except for a very simple case as was mentioned before. If anyone has a suggestion on to do that, that would be fantastic. Uh, but yeah, uh, we, we, we show, the, what we show is that uh, conditional on M, our selection of G doesn't change. And so we believe that this is reassuring, at least uh, in, in line with the fact that we might believe that the heterogeneity depends quite a bit on the, on the number of groups. So uh, choosing M doesn't affect this too much. Okay, thank you. I guess one quick follow up. So when you say that you choose G, when choosing the trade-off for G, um, does this was that choice based on the, I guess, specification that includes both the unobserved heterogeneity across groups, and and not just the NPC heterogeneity? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So we have we we have the we, we actually have an appendix in which in which we show theoretically how the uh, solution of G can change as you add some observable, observable heterogeneity on top of the full heterogeneity that we have. Uh, but we really see our approach as like the most generic one, which nests all the possible heterogeneity you may think about. And if you want, you can add any heterogeneity that you want on top and then whatever is estimated will be a residual while you're not a parameterized. Thank you. I would add that one of the benefits of our selection approach for G is that it's completely non parameter <laughs> So uh, one of the challenges in this context with a lot of the typical approaches that have been used to select the you know, dimensions of, I mean, the number of groups or something like that, like you see in say fact models, other clustering approaches just don't work unless you assume T is going to infinity and in our setting, T is equal to one. So we needed to come up with something that's a little bit different. But I think kind of pulling this approach that we do from the statistics literature is actually one that could be adopted more widely um, in other econometric settings as well. Uh, and I'd also, yeah, to, to follow up on what da Davida says, uh, it, we found it very reassuring that conditional, you know, that for the wide variety of M values that we chose, G didn't seem to vary. And that the M value that we selected is well within oh, the we discussed in the originating computer science literature and coincides with some of the uh, theoretical results that do exist there for the cluster means case. Okay, very good. Uh, let's see, Johannes, you're up now. And somebody probably should be you too. There's a little bit of background. Okay, um, Johannes, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, I promise it's not me. Okay, no, no, it's okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot for the great presentation, first of all. I, I just wanted to quickly up, uh, follow up on this role of uh, non salary income. Is there a reason this is more permanent than salary income? Because, I mean, one, one thing you could, you could worry about here is is that the precautionary behavior of people with higher permanent income is quite different, right? So I'm wondering, since you also have financial income, oh, really? if this is somehow yeah. explaining why you find that this is a relevant dimension of the MPC determination. Yeah, I can, I can answer this. One. Yeah, uh, so I think that this possibly also relates to, to Ralph's question before we mentioned uh, permanent income. Uh, uh, the CX is a, is a quarterly uh, survey and we observe households in five interviews, what, four with, with, with data in that. But income is, me is uh, measured only in the first and the last interview. So we cannot really tell uh, apart high frequency variation in income from low frequency. So you are suggesting that uh, financial income is more likely to be a Permanent? Is that right? I, I put in quite. Yeah, it would be said. interesting to just have a look at because because you know you're mixing two things here which are very different. One are the transfer incomes, and the other are yeah f financial incomes, right? And you would think that potentially the financial income is actually more permanent 
space. Okay. So in we the non salary group, and it might be even from the household perspective, conditional on you know, what kind of what kind of employment contract you have, it might be even considered more permanent than the salary income. I see. Uh, okay, so uh, we have uh, cut. We have. This, uh, disentangle the non-salary income further between the financial component and the rest of it, and the financial component is still positively associated in a significant way. Uh, see, so okay. yeah, we can definitely add that in. I don't, I don't know if we mentioned this directly in the paper. I, I forgot, but we have done that. Cool. Thanks. Oh, you're muted. Sorry, I'm muted. I was trying, the garbage truck was out there. I didn't want to be loud. Okay, well, thank you so much. So we're at time in the chat. If you want to keep the conversation going, and this was a great conversation, there is a Zoom link to another um, just small session. And we'll go like 15 minutes, half an hour, however long. And I'll keep this open so you can, you know, get that, uh, click onto that link if you want to. I just want to say thank you to all of the authors. This was great research and a great presentation. And thanks to all of you. Thanks for having us. <laughs> all right. Very good. Bye. Thank you.